Welcome to OutDrive, folks. I'm your host, Cliff Callis, and each week I'm bringing you actionable marketing insights you can apply to reach, connect with, and convert rural American consumers. OutDrive is powered by Callis, a full-service advertising agency with a focus on marketing rural America. Callis offers a wide range of integrated marketing services, including website development, search engine marketing, social media, video, and digital. We develop strategic and creative campaigns to build your brand and your business. And you can learn more about us at ecalis.com. Now join me in the front seat as we head out on the road to success. Let's go. Hey folks, welcome to OutDrive. We've got another great story to share with you today about life and work in rural America. I'm pleased to welcome back Josh Tomlinson, Director of Broadcast Services and General Manager at KMOS TV. Josh and I had such a great discussion last week about broadcast television in general and PBS specifically that I wanted to bring him right back to continue our conversation. And we're going to get more into streaming TV and talk about some of the effects of the pandemic and educating our next generation of broadcasters. So with that, welcome back to OutDrive, Josh. Thank you for having me back on. I really appreciate it. Well, I've been looking forward to continuing our conversation. We were kind of running up the clock last week and wanted to be sensitive to both of our schedules but felt like we really had some more things that we could talk about. And so I think kind of where we cut it off, we were talking about streaming TV and some of the effects to broadcast TV. And, you know, people just aren't watching television the way that they used to. And of course, we have so many more options available to us, not only network television, PBS, now you have all these streaming services, you have YouTube, where a lot of people are going for video. How important is it for you to be seen on multiple platforms? There's probably nothing more important to me than being able to be available for all of our viewers anywhere they're viewing. Whenever they first started launching the PBS app and the YouTube premium services, which were the first two live linear streams we were available on, I actually had contacted a third-party company called LTN Global to make it so where we were ready to go first thing. and so. We were able to launch in the first cohort of that because we had done all this background work. And as each new system comes on, we do everything possible to get there. One of the things that I think is important is it helps so much that PBS is taking charge of negotiating with the larger platforms for all of the stations, because I can only imagine the nightmare to be to try and have and West TV negotiates solely with YouTube. <laughs> Our goal is always to be wherever the viewers are. And that goes back to probably about 25, 30 years ago, whenever satellite TV became really prevalent. And the mindset at the time, and this is well ahead of my time here, was that broadcast was the most important thing. And so we kind of let it go that we would follow along the DMA that we were assigned, and which is Columbia Jefferson City. It's a fantastic DMA, and we're lucky to be a part of it. But that actually cuts our satellite viewership in half. So you don't get to watch KMOS on uh, DirecTV and DISH if you're in Warrensburg, where our studios are located. And those agreements were held fast to for the last you know two and a half decades. And so we knew that whatever the next generation of TV was, we weren't going to let that happen again. So we make sure that whatever streaming service we have allows our entire over-the-air coverage area to be met. Of course, you don't want to start encroaching on another station's territory, and I completely understand that. But some of the areas that we have overlap with other stations, we're lucky now that the people can pick which station they want to watch at which time. So it means... and. Say in Warrensburg, you get double the PBS. You can watch KMOS. If you don't like what's on KMOS, you can watch KCPT. If you don't like KCPT, you can watch KMOS. It's great. It's um, And that's where streaming is very important for us. And how important it is to get everywhere that anyone can watch us. And of course, that's our live linear stream that we're talking about. So whatever you're wa- you would watch on cable or satellite on channel 6.1, you can watch on those apps over the internet. 
Well, I liked your phrase about going where the viewers are. You know, that's mm -hmm. one of the primary philosophies that we're incorporating into all of our clients' marketing plans is finding out where you're going to reach your customers the best and then be in there, you know, whatever it is. And that's taking a very strategic approach to the communications process. So thinking about your viewers, how do you market your station to new viewers? How do you bring on people to PBS? One of the things that w there's a luxury that PBS is is such a well-known and well-respected brand. So we already have that going for us. So the big thing from that to take after that is so we take what everyone knows about PBS and we marry it with what we do at Cam West that sets us apart from other stations with the unique programming we produce, with the unique content we purchase from other vendors like the BBC or American Public Television. And we target our marketing to say to people, we are your local PBS station. So an example of that is by law, we're required to have a legal ID once an hour. And so during all of our breaks, we have these nice little produced IDs that come up. And it's, of course, you know, Sedalia always goes first because Sedalia is a city of license, but they will also say we're Columbia's PBS, we're Jefferson City's PBS, we're Fulton's PBS, we're Moberly's PBS, Macon's PBS, all the way down to, you know, Sedalia's PBS, of course, Warrensburg PBS, all the way down to some of the smaller communities. And we're adding new IDs all the time. And so we want to make sure that people know that we're your local station. And that's one of the things that we do to market. The other thing that we have is whenever we do a program like making, where we get to feature artists, entrepreneurs, and innovators from our area, and we release the individual stories, we make sure we tag the local community and we tag who we're featuring in our social media posts. And then they turn around and share it and they let people know these cool things are happening for them. And it's because of Kim West. So our biggest thing that we do to drive marketing is to make sure that people understand we're not just a TV station, we're a part of the community. Well, I think that's a great approach. And, and local is so important, especially out here in rural America, because we don't have our own, but we do, right? You're right. What's your fastest growing demographic? Do you know? Yeah, the fastest growing demographic is the younger generation, Gen Z and Millennials, they are watching more PBS than ever, and they're watching it in two ways. So the way that it used to break down is whenever you'd see the ratings on PBS is we called it the canoe effect. You'd see a line from two to 13, and then it would just drop off and it would come back around 45 and over. And so you had this canoe where you lose all these viewers between 13 and 45. And with a lot of the programming changes PBS has put in, a lot of the content we've been able to bring and prevalence of digital content that we create and that PBS creates, we're seeing that audience come back to us in a significant way. Of course, we'll always have, I, I hate to say the term lock because I never want to take for granted any of our viewers, but it feels like that we'll be able to always assume that we're going to have the viewers from age 45 to well into their 90s. As a matter of fact, I talked to a viewer of ours recently who is watching Cam West, Cam West on her iPad, and she's 97 years old. <laughs> so the importance of going into where the viewers are. But yeah, so that, that's been the biggest growth area has been the younger generation. And I think a lot of it goes to is they're a little bit pickier on content because of the YouTube generation. They are more used to content that is not narrative based. And there is a less of our content is narrative based. It's more documentary. It's more Nova, Nature, American Experience, things like that. And then the PBS digital shorts. And then we're also seeing growth at the station level with our red digital studio content that our students are created. But that one is an interesting thing to see because the student content can go from a movie review show to a podcast to a mini documentary about like Powell Gardens or the local music organization, the Schoolhouse Jammers. So yeah, that's been the largest growth area for us. Well, that's exciting because I have to think that that holds a lot more growth for you in the future. Mm -hmm. And sustaining it, that's something we're going to have to see going forward. Is I don't want to assume that once, you know, that we're just going to keep them. We we have to find out what they're watching and keep 
bringing that and then also figure out what the next generation is watching. The worst thing that you can do is assume that you have that you are always going to have the audience with what you're doing. And that's what separates PBS and KMOS, I think, a little bit is broadcast television used to be in the business of content creation. And there is absolutely that. But the most powerful thing that it has going for it now is content curation, curating the content. Because you do have all these streaming services. You have your HBO Max, you have your YouTube, you have Netflix. But one of the biggest things you have to do is you have to pick the content. And with us at the station level, it is important that we curate the best content so that you know whenever you switch into one of our channels, you're getting great content. And I think a lot of people are looking for that. And I think that's what's driving a big portion of our over-the-air viewers that are coming to us. I just saw a survey we did recently, and 23% of the people who watch us watch us with an antenna. That's the free over-the-air TV. And it is the idea that I know I, I just don't have it in me today to make another decision. I'm just going to turn on PBS and let whatever they have wash over me and I'm going to enjoy it. And that's why we focus a lot on content curation, both on air and more and more online. We're working on initiatives right now to curate some of our video on demand content and promote that curation where, you know, kind of get the same feel. But yeah, that's, I think, helps us out a lot with that viewer group. Yeah. Well, you mentioned students' involvement in producing content for the station. Talk about the relationship between KMOS TV and UCM and how you're educating this next generation of broadcasters. KMOS is owned and operated by the University of Central Missouri. Uh, it has been since 1978. And ever since the beginning, student participation has been a huge part of it. And that even goes back to that's how I got involved with KMOS. I became involved with KMOS as a student when I was in college. And we have students operating in every area of the station. I think I said it before that if you watch Cam West, everything you watch on Cam West, something has been touched by a student. Broadcast logs completed by the student, on air promotions have been edited by students. And they're all paid, of course. But what it is, is we see ourselves as a real world learning lab when it comes to UCM students. And they get an opportunity to come in and they work with our professional staff and they do the actual work of the station, the things that absolutely have to get done to keep us on the air and keep us broadcasting. And then they also have the freedom to create content on their own. And thanks to our online platforms, including the PBS app or YouTube through Red Digital Studios, we can put that content out in a lot of different ways. As a matter of fact, I'm rolling it out, but uh, sitting on quite a bit of content from what the students produced last semester. And it varies from one of the many documentaries that a student did was on another UCM student who has developed a powerful YouTube following of over half a million subscribers and is going to be showcased on an upcoming television program that's not PBS. I don't know exactly which network it's going to be on, but it's one of those reality shows like who's the funniest person type reality shows. I can't say too much because, you know, it's still embargoed. And sure. so that was an exciting documentary. Then another student did a documentary on the Korean K-pop dance craze in Kansas City and the competition that was up there. A student did a mini documentary on Powell Gardens, the local botanical garden here. That one was a real interesting one. And that one is online now and you can watch it because what they did is they created it very much. They shot it, edited it and produced it very much the vein of a 70s style educational program. And so the style and look of it was just fantastic. And that's something that you realize, and I, you have to realize with the students we work with is the incredible talent they bring to the table. I always say our students are our best idea generators. I could not have pulled off that project, that Powell Gardens project. It would have looked like a ham-handed attempt of somebody trying to imitate something. And he did it in such a way that it just looked so fresh and so new and so realistic that I was envious of his talent. And that's a good place, a good way to be is to be envious. And and he just graduated. His name was Paris Norvell. And he actually won a telly award the prior year for another documentary he did on cybersecurity. So I think in about 10 years, we're going to hear an awful lot out of him and several of the other students that work with them. One of the things I do like to point out is the students at UCM are not required as part of a class to come work at Kim West. 
they have to apply just like they're applying for a job. And so you come to UCM and you get your degree and say communication. And so that's one line on a resume. And then you go and you work for the student newspaper, the Mule Skinner. It's another line on a resume. And then you go to work for Central TV or the Beat radio station, another line on a resume. And you come to work for CAMOS, it's yet another line on a resume. And you can come to UCM and be here for four years and come out with your degree and three or four professional lines on a resume. And we are always pleased to add to that experience for the students that come to UCM. And it adds value to the viewers of KMOS. Absolutely. I think that's tremendous. I was talking to Dr. Tricia Hanson Horn, and she's the public relations instructor at UCM. And she's a sponsor for the innovative PR firm, you know, inside this journalism school and talking about the real world experience that those students that are going through that program get. And I think that's one of the things that makes UCM rather unique, particularly out here in rural America, is the ability for students to graduate and be better prepared to jump right into a career. Yeah. And like I always see stuff like that and that PR firm, that's such a brilliant idea. And I think some of the stuff that's coming out of that is going to be tremendous. And we encourage any of our students that work for us in the promotion to make sure they're a part of that because you know we get a lot of PR students that'll be a part of it here and you know you're not going to get an experience like that anywhere else in Missouri I can't think of any place that's going to give you that kind of experience workforce development is such an important thing these days and it's something I think that all universities could be a part of and that's where I think we fall into play because not being part of the academic unit we're actually doing a fair deal of workforce development by giving them real hands-on experience with the equipment, with the people in the environment. So yeah, I agree 100%. That's some ways it feels like it's one of the best kept secrets, you know, the university is. But I know that more than enough people out there are familiar with the kind of experience and education they can get here. I see the students every day that are doing it. So I think it's a best kept secret, but I know plenty of people know about it. Yeah. Yeah. Need to tell more though. (laughs) <laughs> Let them take advantage of that. So, you know, we're just a year, I guess, sort of past the pandemic. And I know that for education, the pandemic really had some major impact, impacted most every industry in some way. How did it impact what you're doing at KMOS? The impact for us, we knew we were in a unique position to help out with education at that time. Right as soon as they started closing schools, I reached out to the Missouri Department of Education and I said, listen, I've got four channels. We reach a million people in central Missouri. What can we do to help? You know, I'll do anything. And God bless the Missouri Department of Education. They were drinking from a fire hose at that time. And they were like, listen, we appreciate it. We're going to keep that information handy, but we've got fires to put out right now. And I realized at the time, I was like, yeah, they do. We cover over 400 schools and 160 school districts in our viewing area. And we are also, again, we just talked about being part of the University of Central Missouri. So I knew we could do something. And so I I reached out to the UCM College of Education. And I said, I would like to see if what we can do to help out with this situation where all the kids are all of a sudden at home. We didn't even try and we weren't going to be able to replace their in-class education. And so talking to the experts over there, one in particular, Dr. Angela Danley, she said that the largest achievement gap is always for kids K through five, and it's always during the summer. So the information they learn during the school year gets kind of lost over the summer, and they spend a lot of time in the beginning of the school year remembering that stuff again before they could start on the new thing. And so in talking to her, she convinced me that the thing to focus on would be to, instead of replacing education, is to help close that achievement gap. Then this was all in March of 2020. And so she identified three student teachers who had their student teaching had ended early because of the pandemic. And we brought them on board and they created 72 lesson plans for K through five. And we produced those lesson plans in a classroom here on campus. And we aired them on KMOS three hours a day. So three hours a day for a six week session for K through five education to help close the achievement gap. And the big thing was everything that we did in that program, we called it KMOS Classroom Summer School. 
it had to be all contained within that program. Like if you were the teacher and the student was going to need something, it'd have to be something they had in their house. They wouldn't have, nobody have to have an extra handout. Nobody would have to have an extra thing. And so they had created this curriculum based on the Missouri Department of Education's curriculum so that it could be followed, but it would follow along what any school is doing. And we created 72 individual on-air classrooms and we aired them multiple times over the last three years. And we started the project at the end of March and they were on air by the 1st of June. And so we aired that all summer. And if in thinking about it now, I almost get a retroactive hernia and how big of a project it was to get done in that short of time. But it was, you know, on that very first day we put it out, we got an email from a parent as a student. They were as a counting exercise and the teacher had beans, I believe it was. And there's a picture of this student at home following along, watching the Cam West classroom lesson. That was so very fulfilling over the entire time we aired it to see it here from all the kids and families that that's what their kids did every morning from June to August, from 9 a.m. to noon, I was watch the Cam West classroom summer school. And that was our biggest thing that we did individually as a station. And then, of course, the PBS learning media, all the free content available to people at home through the Internet was a fantastic boom. But we did realize that we cover a large rural area and we wanted to make it so the kids who didn't have high quality or reliable Internet had some sort of education. And that was what came was classroom summer school was. It was interesting as I was on a call with the other general managers in the state right before we were launching it. And I talked about us doing that. One of the other stations was like, wow, that's that's huge. And they turned around and they did something similar on their station afterward. And somebody said to me, they go, Aren't, doesn't it bother you? They stole your idea. And I go, well, first of all, I to credit me with the idea of putting a class on air was is not true at all. That's been that's been done since the day somebody had a camera. Distance learning is not something I invented. And the other is if we inspired another station to do that with the local teachers in their area and all the kids in that area got to learn from their local teachers on air, I think that's fantastic. That's what we're here for. I mean, there is no competition when it comes to this. We reached out to companies like Scholastic, Simon & Schuster, Time for Kids, all these organizations about to use their content in our lessons and all these different educational organizations. And without fail, every single one of them and every author we talked to was like, yes, go ahead. Absolutely. And the Time for Kids, and they came in and they go, hey, if you want we can put together a special issue based on what you guys are doing. And you could send that out to the kids too. And, you know, we sent them what they did, what we were doing and they, they sent us some stuff back and made that available, but it was not needed. You didn't have to have it to get it out there. And so, you know, just seeing that us and other stations did it as much as we could during the pandemic to try and help out, it was nothing at all like what the people, the nurses had to do or the doctors or the people in retail who went to work every day in the middle of this pandemic. It was nothing compared to what they were doing, but hopefully it made some of their lives a little bit easier by at least keeping their kids in an educational mindset. Well, it was something you could do. And I mm -hmm. think it's truly fantastic. And, you know, it's amazing to me hearing that story and thinking about others I've heard is how much can get done in a very short time when you're really motivated to make it happen? And, you right. know, I think about just here yes. at our agency, uh, and, you yeah. know, we, we were remote for eight weeks. We didn't miss a beat. And, oh, yeah. uh, you know, it was such an incredible learning experience. I mean, yeah, there were certainly hardships for most everybody in some way or another, but lots of learning went on during that time. It was very transformative to society as a whole. I mean, there were some areas where, as a society, we didn't necessarily pull together, but I think where it counted, we absolutely did. When I think what you did was very forward thinking, even though it had been done before, uh, you saw an immediate need and you jumped in and met that need. As you look out ahead, what do you see for the future of broadcast TV? 
I think that broadcast TV is going to continue to have a place in media. I think one of the things that it's going to be a struggle for a lot of people with a legacy broadcast mindset is how how it is probably not going to be the number one facet. As a matter of fact, I don't think that it is absolutely the number one facet of media out there. I think that it is another, it's, it's instead of becoming the primary focus of a media organization, it's another tool in the toolbox. And once people can wrap their heads around that, it will do just fine. I mean, how often when FM started to become the biggest thing out there, the people said AM radio was going to die. Well, AM radio is still around. And they said video killed the radio star. Well, radio is still around. They've all certainly changed. There's no doubt about that. Print media is still out there, but it has changed too. And I think that as long as the organizations like KMOS and the PBS stations are focusing on local and featuring what's local, it'll always have a place. When you lose that local aspect, that's where you're going to see the broadcast areas consolidate and shrink up. The fact that you still have that efficient one-to-many distribution platform of broadcast, as long as you have a receiver, be it a radio or a TV receiver and an antenna, you could pick it up, is always going to be something that's important. Free is always going to get you somewhere. It's not free to us. I mean, we've spent quite a bit of money to keep it going, but free to the the person at home. So it goes back to what I said about content curation, not content creation, is if you want to be relevant, you got to give people what they want to watch. You got to make it local and make it unique and just go to wherever they are and broadcast a part of that. Yeah, absolutely. As you said, just another tool in the tool belt. Well, Josh, I've really enjoyed visiting with you again over the last couple of weeks. As we close, what else would you like to share with our OutDrive audience today? I think I've probably bloviated enough. I don't think that there's much that individually I can add. You've given me plenty of opportunities to talk about everything. I would uh, encourage everyone to, at any point you can, go and, and watch some PBS and be it online or on your TV or on the app, on your phone, and just enjoy some of the great content that's available from not just KMOS, but all PBS stations that are out there. You know, with nearly 350 stations and entities producing content, I'm sure you'll find something you like. Great pitch. (laughs) Josh, thanks for being with us. Yes, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Good. Well, folks, thanks for listening to OutDrive. I hope you've enjoyed our visit today with Josh Tomlinson, Director of Broadcast Services and General Manager at KMOS TV in Central Missouri. Come back again next week, and I'll take you down the roads of rural America, where it's heaven on earth. Thanks for taking a ride with us on OutDrive. This episode is complete, so head on over to eCallus.com for show notes and more insight you can apply to help drive your business growth. And be sure to sign up for our free monthly e-letter, OutThink, for even more helpful content about marketing to rural America. Have a great day and keep on driving.